All right, so welcome everybody. Uh, the session has begun. Uh, it's, it's definitely a, a pleasure to introduce Scott Becker uh, to the Staff B call. For those of you who, who may not know, St um, Scott is the Executive Director at APHL with over 20 years experience, is that right, Scott, at APHL alone? And even a bit more um, Yes, yes, what you're saying is I'm old, yes. <laughs> I'm saying that you're wise and you have an incredible perspective um, bring to the field. And I think, especially with that years of experience is particularly interesting because I think what you're seeing in public health bioinformatics is a lot of people who are relatively early career in public health, myself included, um, being under five years. So it's hard for us to contextualize sometimes when people talk about the revolution happening in public health. To us, it's always been about this transition to whole genome sequencing. So from that perspective and um, your years of experience is, is that, and of course your position now is one of the major reasons uh, that I thought that you'd be very helpful in this group to try to navigate uh, what we're doing, what's happening, and uh, give us reference to in terms of what you've seen successfully happen throughout public health and transitioning to two new technologies and adopting um, new policies and best practices, all those kinds of things, um, I think will be very helpful. And I think you guys are hearing my audio cut in and out, so hopefully that was somewhat clear, Scott? Yes. Okay, nonetheless. So with that introduction, Scott, welcome to Staff B, uh, the State Public Health Bioinformatics work group. Uh, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you so much, um, Kevin, for inviting me, and thanks to the group to uh, have me on for this call. I'm, I'm honored and in many ways humbled to be here um, because it's you, what you deal with is so technical and, and frankly, um, not what I do. So I'm excited because um, you're this group is such an important part of APHL and it grew up organically. And what I've been so excited about was to, is to see the progression with, um, with, within bioinformatics and, and meaning within public health um, and to see the integration and as you, as you noted, the transition. I want to just do a sound check. Um, I know Kevin's, uh, was was coming in and out. Can someone uh, let us know whether mine is clear? You're good, Scott. Hey, Scott. Okay, Scott. great. Five five. So what that means is the pipeline into APHL is much stronger than the pipeline into into Virginia. So <laughs> that's good to know. Um, so, you know, what I, I've been thinking about this, and again, it is a little bit daunting, um, but I do want to just give you some of my perspectives on on but not bioinformatics, the field, but on um, integrating within public health. And the way I look at this very much is the way I look at things in our own association. When there's something new in public health or there's something new that the association has to deal with, we bring in new people with new perspectives and we integrate with people who have already a seasoned perspective um, or perspectives, and we, we watch that magic happen. Uh, none of it is particularly quick, and none of it is particularly beautiful at first, uh, because, and I'll use the example from within the association, and this is going to go back in history, and I know there are people on the line who lived through this, um, like John Fontana, I see he's on the line, and um, there's probably others. Um, going back to the anthrax attacks when when anthrax first happened and was detected in 2001 2002 that was a new experience now we were prepared but fully prepared probably not the the types of individuals that we had on board um, honestly did the best they can and i'm i'm now speaking for the association not not really thinking about the members at this moment from the staff perspective, we were slammed with media hits. I mean, now we call them hits. We didn't call them hits then, but we were slammed with media. Um, one day alone, we had 60 media requests. We didn't have a communication staff. We didn't have a system in which we can handle that. 
Um, and what we did is we brought in uh, somebody who was an expert in that particular area, not crisis communications, but broadly communications. And when that person came to APHL with a new set of eyes and a new skill set that we had not yet integrated or was not aware of, it was like they landed from a different planet. They were speaking a different language. Um, so some of that might be familiar to you as you have come on to or come into the public health laboratory field or the public health field in general, where for some of you, um, you have very specific bioinformatics knowledge. And, and others I know on the call have um, broad microbiology and are, and are now in the bioinformatics space. So, you know, what we're seeing is this blending. And what I've seen at the association over time is this blending. And, and this, this happened not just in communications, but when we brought Peter Kyriakopoulos on staff to lead our public policy, he speaks a different language. You know, what appropriators speak and what lobbyists speak, it is different than the way typical program staff here at the association speak. And it does take a long time. Peter came from another planet. He wouldn't disagree with me on that. <laughs> um, and the kinds of things that, that we do here at the association on behalf of members requires all of those skill sets. One of the most exciting things that I did in my first year at APHL was attend a, meet, attend a meeting at the White House on food safety. And that was when we were touting the transition to PFGE. And PFGE at the time was only in certain states. And, and, and that was the beginning of sort of the area labs, I think they called them. Um, and, and it was, it, you know, at that moment, we were going through a transition. Now that had a policy implication it had a huge practice implication, and it had a huge science implication. And those are the three areas then that if you've heard me before, you know that is the sweet spot for APHL. Science, policy, and practice, where that all comes together. And I think that those of you in Staff B, those of you on the call, those of you in your varying roles are representative of aspects of that. Some of you are involved in all of it. Some of you are involved in in, in, in maybe one or two areas of it. But those are critically important to keep in mind as you go through whatever your work is. Now that we are transitioning, of course, um, or have transitioned um, you know, successfully, largely successfully, into, um, you know, into sequencing. Um, when, when I was at the White House so many years ago discussing food safety and learning about how this system works, we recognized, um, and, and this is through discussion with many others, that PFGE was a transition that was going to take a long time. Not transitioning from previously what was done into PFGE, but that PFGE itself was a short-term solution. Now that short-term lasted 15, 18, almost 20 years, right? Until something else. That's actually one of the hallmarks of, I think, public health, is that we don't stand still. So the science doesn't stand still, the issues don't stand still, public health doesn't stand still. And that's, the, that's, that's absolutely critical to know about the laboratory. The laboratory is seen as you know, sort of staid and true, and, and, and it, it, it's all about the science, which is true. But remember, the science keeps changing. It changes for us slower than it may change, certainly in the academic community. It is slower, perhaps, than it might change in, in industry. But what we do is really, we are the vanguard for what will happen elsewhere. Um, because things happen in public health, and public health is expected to react first. So we are, by, by nature, I think, much more cautious about things like transitions. And this transition is something that um, has taken a long time, will continue to take a long time. But the people on this call are absolutely critical to those transitions, to the, the you know, I don't want to call it new science because as I've learned many, many, from many of you, you know, sequencing's been around a long time. It may be new to us and the way we're using it may be new 
But when you think of a public health system, this is a dramatic shift. This is a dramatic shift not just for the laboratory and not just for how data exchange or data transmission works. This is a huge change for public health practice and, and, and certainly for the field of, of uh, epidemiology. And we, we know that and, and we predicted that this is something that is going to take time. Um, so I want to stop there for a minute um, and take a sip of water. But in the meantime, um, I wanted to um, see if there were any questions just at this, at this particular point. This would be where you can take yourself off mute. Yeah. I Scott, I, I think I, I want to try to take the opportunity to ask uh, one of the first questions. You talked about how the science, especially in bioinformatics, or at least historically, public health had to be a little bit slower than academia, and, and especially being particularly conservative in the transitions. But I think right now it's actually a really interesting time because for whole genome sequencing data, at least for the enterics right now, most of the data being generated is from public health labs. So more insight can actually be drawn and more data is being um, put out there by public health labs uh, before even academia. So things are happening so dynamically and us trying to understand that, that looking to the people who have expert in this there's not many people who have that much expertise in this so I don't know if you can, can speak on that and clarify that and how this changes yeah actually this would be a good time and let me let me help answer that by going to share my screen so let me let me do that because I want to show you where we at APHL see this fitting see this going from a strategic uh, vantage point so I'm going to share my screen by doing this and going here. Okay. So I hope you all can now see my screen, which has, to some of you may be familiar, to some of you may be brand new. It is not a tree, okay? Um, so it, it is the strategic map of APHL. And we start at the top with the central challenge for these few years which is to expand the impact of the public health lab system at national and global levels. That's supported by four goals. That is supported by a multitude of objectives. Underpinning all of this is the cross-cutting goal of engaging and mobilizing key partners. So this, this is where I begin with the idea that we can and should not do anything alone. There are inputs, there are things we do to process information, specimens, et cetera, and then there's outputs. So much like a laboratory system or a laboratory, APHL feels very similarly that we must engage and mobilize key partners for our, for our benefit, but for the benefit of, 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 frankly, the common good. And for us, that is the goal of expanding um, the impact of public health lab system, both nationally and globally. Let's move to the second um, column, which is providing services that strengthen lab system effectiveness. Go to that very top one. Develop best practices for members to build relationships with non-traditional partners for data analytics. This map was developed in 2017, okay? But we have been talking about the transition to sequencing and all of what all of the, the challenges and the inputs that would be needed, both from a policy level, a funding level, a technology level, um, a governmental will level, um, for a few years before that. And in fact, I think it was at the 2015 annual meeting, maybe 2016, that we actually had our first set of sessions on sequencing. And that was when sequencing came from, you know, behind the, the, the curtain and was evident, it was obvious that this is where we were going. Um, it was not yet clear what the directions were specifically, and there was a lot, of, uh, a lot of things that had to be worked out, but we knew a little bit of where we were going. So move ahead a few years to when we developed the strategic map. And your point about working with academia, you know, I, I think academia is ahead in some ways, but in terms of practice, 
and their practical approach, that's really where we, we meeting lab, epi, informatics, bioinformatics, and yes, I, of course I distinguish the two, um, but I think they, they work hand in hand in, in many ways. So recognizing now that what we need to do is to develop best practices for members to help build those relationships. We know that those relationships have been built in certain places, and they may have been built um, quickly, and in some cases they're being built. And I'll use the example of uh, Minnesota and, this, and, and working with the Minnesota Supercomputing Center I'm at the university, which is not part of the health department. Yes, they're part of state government, but university and health department, although in that state, work very well together. This was still a new relationship. And you know, you, in, in any new relationship, you have to figure out um, what are the you know what are the pros and cons. What's everyone getting out of it? What's the win-win? And I think that's what we're trying to now think of. Um, and, and it is a priority for 2019, for the calendar year 2019, for us to be able to move this particular objective forward of developing these best practices. So I know that at, at one point, probably in the next few months, the work group that we have established um, is going to come to this group and get, get your input because you're the ones on the ground, in, in the labs, in the states, in EPI, working working on this um, so it says for data analytics and i think that was the big barrier in our mind back in 2017 because states did not have the pipelines labs did not have the pipelines health departments did not have the pipelines just the the language was new so i think these are all evolving and changing and and are in in a much much better state than they were back in even 2017 You'll see the second objective there, which is to promote, design, and develop the informatics infrastructure. Now, this is big and audacious. Um, we recognize that. Um, and what, what the group is, is, is actually doing is molding, melding those two together to say, we have just a really super big informatics, bioinformatics, data analytics, Big data, although I hate that term, um, but it is an all-encompassing term. Um, we have stuff to do in this area and, and things that we need to do to help our members progress. Um, so you'll also see in, in some of the other areas that are highlighted, for example, on the lower left, um, a priority for this year, elevate and promote the role of public health labs in the healthcare system. Well, us getting healthcare data that they, that they need uh, to treat the community, to treat the individual, et cetera, is going to go a long way. Um, and then on the uh, far right, uh, one of the ongoing, and on the lower far right, determine the future AIMS business model. Many of you know AIMS, um, APHO Information, uh, Informatics Messaging Services, uh, from one or two of our use cases, including the, uh, the work that we do in bioinformatics on AIMS with the ARLN. Uh, but there are other things, and, and what I'd like to do over time is to figure out what additional use cases there might be that will benefit our members, benefit the states, benefit public health and the public health enterprise using the technology that we built and will continue to evolve. So AIMS, in in many people's mind, it's just what they know of it. There's actually over 20 use cases on AIMS now, and it does a whole lot, a whole lot more. So I'll stop there to say that I think the academic relationship is key, but that we are driving the, the practical aspects of that right now. And I think we're gonna see that more and more um, as additional utility becomes becomes apparent. Um, I do want to put up here a, uh, a an awesome reference if you aren't already aware of it, especially for the laboratorians that um, that work with epidemiology, but maybe or, or the bioinformaticians you may be new to the field of epidemiology. And this is the CDC field epidemiology manual. 
okay? I'm not sure Cameron is here. Um, there is a chapter that is a new chapter in this edition called Optimizing Epidemiology and Laboratory Collaborations. I think it's absolutely key. This um, has a special consideration on classic versus molecular tests. It did not go so far as to deal with sequencing in, in the way I think the next edition will. This just came out, so we can, uh, we, can, we can pursue that in the future. So I'll stop there. Other questions? And then I have a couple of other, other thoughts. This is Scott, this is Joel. Um, before you were talking about the transition from PFGE to whole genome sequencing, and you know, it, it, you understood it was a transition, it took 18, 19, 20 years. Um, is, is everybody as aware as they should be that whole genome sequencing is also a transition that will probably be a much shorter period of time than PFGE as we evolve to more metagenomic or targeted molecular assays? So my answer to that is yes, and here's the three initials why, AMD. We did not have a program that was looking at innovation back when we were transitioning from culture and other methods to PFGE. I think that the enterprise, the public health enterprise, so I'm gonna say CDC, APHL, CSTE, others, I think have, have learned an awful lot about innovation and about reducing that time to uh, move to new technologies. And the whole technology transfer enterprise is, is very different. So, you know, yeah, now we're looking at what's gonna happen with, um, you know, direct from specimens, right? Those are, that's, that's gonna be sort of another, yet, yet another step. So I do not ever expect this to take um, nearly, nearly as long as it did um, because we have some of those systems in place. And APHL, it was one of the first and loudest supporters of the AMD initiative for this very reason. Because in order to stay on the cutting edge and in order to be able to respond and answer the questions that we need to, we can't be looking at historical data. We can't be looking at data that's a year or, or older. Um, we can't take so long for us to go from uh, you know, point of detection to mounting a response. We've got to be able to shorten that window and technology is going to be one of the ways to do it. And that technology, of course, is not just lab technology. It, it is also bioinformatics. It is also data exchange and informatics, and it's also people. So the workforce is absolutely critical. So encouraging and um, doing everything we can in terms of training, retraining, and finding new people. What, what, we're, what we are seeing, though, is a culture change within laboratories because we now have people that have never been trained classically in microbiology. Um, we have people who, have, who are trained in sequencing and or molecular working with classically trained. We don't want to lose classical methods because they have a role, but I think gr a greater focus is on new technologies. I hope that helped answer your question, Joel. It will not take 20 years. There's no way we can let that happen. Well, it was just that to make sure that they're not expecting the comfort of 20 years doing one thing, it's going to change fast. Yeah. Yes, and I, and I think we in the lab and we in the informatics and bioinformatics sphere have got to remind people of that all the time. And we do that by bringing out what is the latest and greatest use. We may not incorporate it, but we need to be aware of what else is going on. Because from the policy level, there is a greater thirst for uh, response a lot quicker. You know, the, the times of us saying good, and I remember it because it's part of my message palette to the media, good science takes time. It is true, good science takes time and you need to make sure you get it right, but you also can't, um, you can't spend a lot of time uh, on, you know, I, I think we just need to move quicker, and, and, and I think that's, that's recognized now. So I have a question. 
you mentioned um, the transition from PFTE to sequencing. And I think it's interesting to kind of note that in that transition, not only did we transition to a new technology of sequencing, but we also had to uh, develop and transition to a new way of handling data. And so I'm curious if in like a few years, do you see more usage of the computational power that's being built because of that data? Could we, do you see a transition away from maybe older techniques of analyzing and corresponding with EBIs that might move into some more like machine learning or mathematical models to kind of help predict these outbreaks? That's a great question. Um, actually, I posed this question to a colleague in epidemiology two weeks ago, and I said, what is the role of AI in EPI? And they were not yet ready to really answer that. I think, I, again, this is an area that I think is going to need a lot more um, thoughtful approach in how we, how we get there. I want to have APHL, and I want to have you all and, and, and our members be out there looking at, researching, determining what is the best role for that. Because I actually think that will that has the possibility, along with um, you know the, the the power, the computational power of what we're developing now, um, to actually change the field even further. Um, so if we think that what we're doing now is special, you know, just let's let's wait seven years. Seven years sounds like a long time. It it, it is and it isn't because I think things are really shaking out. I think there's a lot of um, other kinds of issues that are that are getting in the way right now. There's some policy issues, data sharing issues. There's some states using cloud. Um, so th those are those are real challenges. So to me, the five to seven year window is going to be really key. So as as you pointed out at the beginning, Kevin, it is an exciting time to. To, to be in this field, because um, it, is, it is truly uh, a time in transition. Um, I wanted to also think about um, the kinds of skill sets that are necessary uh, to succeed in, um, in public health. And one of them is the skill of perseverance, um, the skill of patient, the skill of diplomacy. Those are really important skills within, within our field. I think what, what the work that you're doing really represents this new dynamic. And it's going to take a lot of perseverance and a lot of good communication skills to be able to explain the utility and the differences uh, to a variety of, of, of types of individuals. So the generation that's leading the labs is really gonna change in the next number of years. And we're, we're already seeing that. So I think it's gonna be really important to put on your teaching hat as well in a way that uh, will help lab directors and health officials really understand how technology is changing and what promise it, it has without overselling it. Um, I think those are those are important things. So perseverance, communication, and and the diplomacy skills are really important. And and I'm going to leave the discussion of what computational skills to other people. <laughs> I think it's also important to um, always understand the policy um, realm and understand what's going on in national policy to understand really where, where some of these things fit. Um, and, that's, and that's something that, you know, hopefully through APHL and, and other organizations, you, you have the opportunity to, to do that. But it's, it, to me, it's really important that, that this group really embed itself uh, with strong leadership and, you know, st obviously stick with the science, but, you need communication, you need policy, you need dis diplomacy, you need leadership as well. Hey, Scott, uh, this is Sean from Minnesota. Um, a quick question for you. So um, I saw the strategic map that the strength, the quality improvement um, is one of the IPHR's priority. I'm just wondering, um, using PostNet as an example, you know, they reached a very good, or set up a good example of a 
nationality. Uh, you just cut out. Oh, um, can you? Hear I think me? you were talking about quality improvement, and then you cut out a little bit. Okay. Yes. So um, for PostNet, it's set really good example to standardize the uh, the bioinformatic analysis part, and for foodborne disease outbreak. Um, could you also comment on other programs at CDC, um, HAI, a vaccine preventable disease, like how we can help uh, in terms of standardize the uh, data processing part? Because right now it's like every program has its own thing and is a big mess there. So that, there, therein lies uh, both a challenge, it's, it's an opportunity and, it's a, and it is a challenge um, because frankly of the way um, the way these programs grew up and the, the need to drive change. So for example, PulseNet was always a sta using a standardized approach and that was much like LRN, we, we, we do the same thing. And I think in other areas, it's maybe a little less standardized and there's more variability that's allowed. I think that if we can show greater efficiency through standardization, and to me, that, that standardization also speaks to how one embeds and proves um, quality, strengthens quality through, through that, um, because then you can measure it. So it isn't a one-off, but we're all going in the same direction. But I will also say, and this is from my, my history with an APHL, our members are laboratorians, they are curious, and there is a system in place in this country that allows for uh, testing that is done in a quality way, but is done by individual laboratories in slightly different ways. So um, I, I do think that the, the march towards strict standardization um, is certainly there, but I, I think that is going to take a little bit of time and it may be bug by bug, but the more we work with CDC on larger programs like AR, like healthcare, healthcare acquired infections, um, like VPDs, I think we're gonna have a better, a better chance. And the other, the other thing is in terms of efficiency. And we know through initially working with PulseNet through area labs and then working through um, the, re the reference center models that, that we support, AR, ARLN, et cetera, LRN. Not every lab has to do everything, but we have to be part of a national system. And we need to be able to tap into that system on a routine and regular basis and not just during an outbreak or an emergent situation. So I think keeping that, you know, keeping that bar really high is gonna be very important. And that's why we have that focus on quality improvement and safety. And safety is, is really part and parcel of quality system, uh, but we do call it out because of the notoriety and, 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 and the importance of it. I don't know, Sean, did that answer your question, at least in part? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. So the other the other thing I think we have to realize is um, there's a limitation in funding, and that funding is so critical uh, to innovation, to research and development. So I'm going to give you an example within Ames. This is the first year that we've had funding to develop what is essentially a sandbox in Ames to to do some R and D. Um, and that's so important for us to be able to do that, to keep up um, and, and look at new, new tools, new technologies, new techniques uh, to be able to improve our, our data exchange. And I imagine it's, it's quite similar. In fact, I follow a number of you on Twitter and you know who you are and I don't comment on some of your, your threads because I don't understand them. Some of them I do. And I'm absolutely fascinated by some of the tools that are now out there that weren't available a year ago. And I'm so encouraged that you're using them so you're finding your own sandboxes and working, working together. And, and um, I'm just really, really, uh, it, it's, it's a joy to, to, to just read about it and then 
I go to Kristen and have her explain it to me. <laughs> so um, thank you for, for sharing your thoughts on, on, on Twitter and social media. It's really important because it's getting, you know, it's a dialogue that's out there. It's not just hidden in a, in a Slack channel or, or on an APHL channel. Um, it, it's, it's showing that we're out there um, amongst the best, doing the best um, all the time. So thank you. And you know who you are. And those of you who aren't on Twitter, there's a ton of good information on it if you know who to follow. Other questions? I don't want to leave this slide up there. Does anyone else have anything to share? <laughs> you could do do the stop sharing, Scott, and then it'll just go. Yep. Okay. Um, but as other people are starting to think of questions, I wanted to ask Scott, um, you talked about communication, diplomacy, and persistence. And I think throughout the staff B group, we definitely have a lot of persistent scientists, and we're finally all sitting together communicating, at least with one another. Um, but that aspect of diplomacy, that's, that's something that I don't know a lot of us have experience with. Can you tell us how we can use Staff B to promote bioinformatics diplomacy and what that even looks like? Well, it's, it's when, by diplomacy, I mean, there's, there's probably a number of, of ways to think about that. I think there's a couple of, of things that come to mind. One is you are all ambassadors for your field. You are all ambassadors for this transition, for the idea of new technology, for the idea of innovation, in public health. So using that platform. Now, you're, you're not gonna necessarily, you know, be able to walk up to the governor for, you know, per se, uh, but you might, have an ex you might have an opportunity with policymakers that come through, use your communication skills, explain the importance of, of, of the work that's going on and, and what this really means for, for, for people. Um, we get caught up in the technology, we get caught up in this, take it to another level and really, really use your roles, no matter what your roles are. I, you know, there's, there's a lot of folks that are on the line that are in a variety of different roles. You're coming together to share information around bioinformatics and improving that at the state level. Um, you're all in these different roles. You can use, you can use your voice however you can. Um, what I am particularly excited about is that you were one of the first self-forming groups. You're not, you're not a committee of APHL. We have nothing, frankly, we have nothing to do with you. That's not true. I thought Staff B was a small little group that got together to have beers at various conferences. Come to find out it's a community of practice, and that's really something that APHL promotes. And the fact that this community of practice comes together regularly um, and, and contributes to one another and to the overarching um, you know, field is really good. What, what I'd love to do is figure out a way to still get that connection and stickiness with, with Staff B and learn from what you all are doing from a community perspective and see if there's other, other communities with, within the broader APHL or within broader public health that can form. Um, so I, I, you know, I'm looking at you all as both the ambassadors and a little bit of a social experiment and people who like to maybe drink beer occasionally. And I'm, and I'm glad I get invited occasionally. So. I appreciate that. I also want to take, take this moment to say that very soon we are going to be announcing, uh, and we did at the annual meeting, a new conference um, that APHL is supporting a broad infectious disease conference. And I absolutely see um, that, that new technology and bioinformatics um, it can and will be represented well. That's something for August of 2020. Um, we are currently in final site selection and we're, we're just beginning the planning of that. So um, that's, that's another area that I think you all will be able to um, continue to showcase your work and share your work and be ambassadors for the work that you do. APHL could definitely help out fostering staff B by promoting these kind of 
beer drinking activities at national meetings. <laughs> <laughs> we can do that. <laughs> Considering these are not APHL sponsored, happy to do that. <laughs> Hi, uh, Scott. This is John Fontana. Can you hear me? Certainly. Hey, John, how are you? Can't wait uh, for us to be out there next year. Yes, yes, I'm already preparing. <laughs> um, I got a, um, an email from Bill this week. Good. So, uh, you know, I wanted to bring up a point about the staff B group and the AMD CDC group and uh, the uh, bionumerics, because I think that there's kind of like parallel paths that are going on. It would be it would be really good if APHL may play a role as a dip, uh, for diplomacy's sake to get them together to talk more about what they're doing because I think that you know bionumerics is a pretty daunting piece of software and I think that the uh, experiments are just going to expand or change is going to be upgrades and it'd be nice to see the two groups working together because there's a lot of bioinformatics capital in the staff B group so it would be great if APH could play a role in doing something like that. Great, thank you for that. And we can we can touch base um, both with um, Kristen and Kelly and with Sherry, and uh, and figure out the best way to 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 bring that dialogue together. Happy happy to do that, John. Great, thank you. Hi, Scott. This is Glenn Gallagher in Massachusetts. Uh, hey, Glenn. Uh, so I have a question that kind of straddles a couple of the different branches that you had in your strategic plan, and mostly around uh, how we can get better about sharing data for use in by uh, you know, public universities or other groups that are interested in data analytics. So I don't know if you, you have thoughts about how we can get better about sharing data and you know like publicly available ware warehouses. I mean we're I think. On the public health side, we're always a little bit more reserved in what we share because of our uh, confidentiality concerns. But how do we straddle those two needs? It's a great, it's a great point. And in fact, as part of the AIMS business model discussions, we started having that broader discussion about data use agreements and um, even the ability, frankly, of mining the data that we already have uh, for you know, for use by academics and others. So um, I think that uh, honestly, because so much of our work is sponsored through, supported by CDC, I think part of this is gonna be having a specific dialogue with CDC around, uh, around this. I do know that there is a big push, and, and we know this through the work that you all are doing with NCBI and others and, and on the FDA side, there's a, a big push for public use of data. Um, and yes, public health authorities tend to be on the more conservative side on using that data and even having it um, available in different forms. So I, I, I do think though this is changing. I do think um, the policies um, that are being promoted through HHS and others might actually help that a little bit. And, and, and move it further. Um, this is something, if I could figure out a way, and maybe Glenn, you can help me offline, we can think of a way that I can characterize this to bring this to a higher level at CDC, to you know the chief information officer, the, 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 the head of the surveillance group. Because what we find is that, and not unsurprisingly, and for very good reasons, um, individual programs may be less interested in sharing and they want to use those that data for their purposes versus thinking about it for the greater public good. Um, and, and those are not, you know, that's that, that I think it's just a reality. So how we can how we can communicate that is something I'd be happy to work with the small group on. To to add something to that, you know, we were, we were just chatting about bionumerics also. And what bionumerics really has going for it, for me, for me the reason why it's so popular is it's actually a data management and data sharing tool is what it really is and PulseNet through their MOU um, has worked out a way to share all this data and bring all this data together for foodborne outbreaks uh, between states and with the CDC so how does um, you know APHL help state labs and help the CDC 
kind of leverage and use the PulseNet MOU as a model to open up that data sharing for other programs. So why don't we why don't we take we don't have a lot of time let's let's take that offline and have a, a discussion and try and figure out because I you know there's I think there's a lot of nuances around bionumerics that I may not quite grasp um, and I think it does beg the 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 kind of broader the broader question about um, all public health data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I guess, it, you know, it, it, it's kind of, it's not so much the nuances of bionumerics, but it seems like PulseNet has really paved the way for a lot of data sharing. And, yes. And so how do we use that example of PulseNet and expand, instead of trying to recreate the wheel for data sharing for other organisms, how do we mimic what's been successful already for PulseNet and move that into other areas? What's the empty new system called? Genome so how does it differ from genome tracker? Well, what, I, what I'm thinking about specifically is with the different public health labs, you know, there, there's um, metadata and PHI um, within the, the bionumerics and things that get, you know, th there's more robust data within the bionumerics system and with the PulseNet database, which gets shared than what gets shared with NCBI. Okay. okay. So it's, there, there's some data management tools. And, and if you read through the MLU for PulseNet, there's a lot of, you know, it's, it's understood it's for public health. It, actually, it's surprising reading the MLU from PulseNet, how um, broad it actually is. And it leaves room for other organisms to move into that space. Um, so it, it's just something that I think we could use for other organisms that aren't as politically hot topic like TV or something like that, but other organisms that we could start moving into and use that model for. Yeah, so it's no. the model, not necessarily the software. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. But, yeah, Go thank ahead. you for that, Scott. I, th I think that's a, a great way to move forward and have CDC help us uh, drive some standardization across the, the nation. And uh, I mean, I think that's going to be the most useful way to make the data available to our to partners because I, I think data standardization is the, the biggest problem in these having you know a bunch of disparate databases that people are trying to pull data from. So if we can start to get that available to more people, then more and more insights are going to come from that data. Right. Great. And I know that Christy Kubota from our staff, from the PulseNet staff is on is on the line as well. So so Christy will include you for sure in our in our uh, additional dialogue. Well this this is Duncan. Then I mean, I, I do have a, some perspective. You know, I, I think foodborne has several advantages. One, you know, it's got over 20 years of history uh, with public health labs. It's a known quantity. It's something that everyone is familiar with. And so, you know, the intense, the the value of sharing those data is pretty well established, and it's got a long track record of doing that pre-genomics. And I, th I think that that was very helpful. Even so, though, you know, it was a very nuanced discussion to renegotiate the MOUs to really talk through what the, the implications were on the sharing of metadata and to come with some agreement uh, on the framework for that. Um, but it was done very deliberately to ensure that it left the door open for other, other pathogens to leverage that same sort of data sharing infrastructure. Uh, you know, obviously different surveillance platforms are gonna have different needs, different, uh, different goals. Um, not every program is, is a pulse net. Um, but but the goal is to use a lot of that shared um, shared infrastructure, if you will, or the, the shared agreements to, uh, to to enable data sharing. You know, some of the metadata fields that we looked at. Weren't so, Duncan, is is there an approach, or is there a um, I I don't know what I call it a governance group at CDC that is is actually looking at at, at this issue? Oh, thank you for that. We. <laughs> We, we desperately needed to see something other than the power pack. <laughs> Sorry, I haven't, I haven't figured out how to uh, turn on the right camera yet. Um, is there Sorry. a government group or a, a group that's actually, that's dealing with that or could deal with it? In terms of data sharing? Uh, so there, it is an area that we're starting to work on more. Uh, for instance, our office has recently brought on Beth Neuhaus from FLU to focus on some of these data integration, data sharing issues um, as part okay. of her portfolio. 
Uh, and it's something that we're starting to have broad conversations with across the agency. Um, you know, we're also working with a number of our international partners uh, on standardization of bioinformatics and standardization of, of data structures. So, um, you know, we're trying not to necessarily make this exclusive to the CDC and the U.S. public health system. Ideally, we'd like something that'll work fairly globally uh, and to tap into some of those global standards as they emerge. But as you, as everyone on this call knows, really there's not a lot of consistency out there. Um, you know, Foodborne sort of put a stake in the sand and said, you know, here are the data, metadata fields we're gonna contribute. We're switching to um, more of an open data model. Uh, and here's the schedule on which we're going to actually submit metadata fields in a structured way. Uh, and other programs have started to follow suit. Uh, what I will say is that a lot of CDC programs are taking advantage of that already. You know, they're looking at the PulseNet model, they're using it as a justification to, for their partners for data sharing, uh, and they're starting to use those same data fields as a basis for, for data sharing and submission. Great. Thank you. I, I, you know, I don't know if you were on earlier when I was, when I was commending AMD. I, I really think it's it's the reason why we are continuing to think about innovation in technologies, both in lab and epi and surveillance and in informatics and bioinformatics. I really think it's, it's been, been extraordinarily pivotal. So thank you for your leadership in, in, in all that you do at AMD and across CDC. Well, thank you. But you know, as you know, it's a team effort and APHL has been a critical partner in doing that. Actually, everyone on this call has been a critical partner in helping to evolve this. And I think one thing that AMD has done uh, is, you know, there really hasn't been a lot of opportunity for broad-based innovation funding in public health, and AMD really provided that. And it also provided it at a time where the ground was very fertile. You know, a lot of people were sort of struggling with the same issues. A lot of people saw the same opportunities. And so really the funding has been very catalytic in, in terms of effect. You know, people, people already had great ideas in terms of how they wanted to hit the ground running and they just needed the resources to do it. Right. Well, we're trying to replicate that with uh, data. Our data is elemental campaign for the surveillance enterprise. So we'll, we'll see how far we get this year. All right, in the last five minutes, are there any other questions for Scott? Hi, this is Lauren from Virginia. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. Hey, Scott. So this has been a really great call. Thank you for doing it. Um, I was curious. I'd, I'd like to know if you could share your thoughts about um, programmatically, you know, where you see um, the next big um, investment and in development or implementation for next-gen sequencing for infectious diseases um, beyond what we've been doing the past few years for foodborne nationally. Uh, that is out of my wheelhouse. I, I will say that, um, wow, no, it's a great question. I, you know, the, 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 the various programs that were early adopters, uh, and I, and I use that term lightly, um, that were thinking about sequencing have gotten a lot further because of AMD. Um, I could not predict myself without doing further, further research um, as to where, what the next big one's gonna be. I actually think that there's a number of big ones. So we're seeing a lot of action in TB. Um, I think influenza um, is, is another area and that's some, and, and those are two really critical areas in public health. Um, I think also, I, I, I'd have to say that I would put AR in the same, in the same realm. Um, it's different than TB because we're now seeing, you know, we're, we're, we're seeing outbreaks in places we didn't see before. Uh, TB, I think, is a bit more classic. Um, we're, 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 used to, we're used to that maybe a little bit more. But I don't see one as big as Enterix. And I think we knew that going into it, which is why I think uh, that was – Sort of job one, if you will, from a broad national standpoint. Um, but I'd actually be really curious, and I know there's no time left, but this is something I would love to get everybody's input on the call. I'd love to know all of your thoughts on it. We could collect it and then report it back 
So is that something, Kristen, we can, we can just do a, a quick and dirty survey that we send to all of you? Because um, I, I think you're the ones that have your eyes on the... On the that. I will say this data is about a year old in terms of where labs were moving towards the most next. Um, HAIs were the biggest field kind of the people that public health labs are looking to do to expand sequencing to. Um, I think about half of the lab survey, that was kind of their next big frontier after enterics. Um, but we can definitely. And, and I'd love to learn more from you guys about where, where things are in terms of, um, you know, direct, direct from the specimen. That's, I know that's research that's going on. Um, I'd love to understand what you, where you think things are going, because I think that'd be, that would actually be really helpful for me and my work in communicating what our priorities are. I think that, that you, you're a group that we have not tapped in for that sort of uh, information gathering, frankly, because you're, you're standalone. And I, I honestly don't feel totally comfortable until now. Um, <laughs> Of, of seeking that um, because it's it is less it is less formal yeah I will say I feel like the areas that there's been a lot of traction a lot of interest in kind of expanding use of sequencing I know we're getting really short on time um, are ones where some of the current testing and it's just not quite sufficient yet so yeah. you know with TB the idea of going direct from specimen with the amount of cultural time is needed that there's a ton of interest there obviously and also the clinical implication of being able to figure out um, antibiotic resistance and that sort of thing kind of motivates it I know with Legionella it was the fact that there wasn't great source tracking and sequencing mm -hmm. opened the door to maybe figure out where the, the, the sources were faster and more accurately. But that's still, there's only um, one state or two, one, two jurisdictions I know of that, that mandate that. Right. So otherwise right. it's really depends yeah. on if the program is, even cares about doing it. Exactly. So, I mean, I think it's often like, even if we're not quite sure where next sequencing is, is to look at what the current conventional testing are, figuring out what the gaps are there, and then looking yeah. back to see, could sequencing fill a, fill a gap there. And, and that's a question also, Duncan, I, you know, I'd love to get your input from the AMD perspective on, has there been a, a you know, an assessment done of late in, in, for that particular question? Uh, well, we, we can get into it, but. Um. <laughs> it's even better, it gets better. Yeah. I, I think we're close to time right now. I, I, I can't give you a nuanced answer at this point. <laughs> yeah, but that is something, Scott, we could definitely put together a poll and distribute it out to the staff fee community to see what yeah. the community has to input and offer on the MPHL. And we are at the top of the hour, Scott. I wanted to give you an opportunity uh, to give any final words you'd like to tell the group or, or ask of us or whatever it is you feel to say. No, uh, just uh, again, I'm really, really grateful for the opportunity and I'm really pleased to be part of your social experiment of being a a group outside, but a, but a group connected, and I, and I really appreciate that. Um, and if there are things that you all collectively think that we, we can do, um, you know that, that we're here to support you, Kristen's here, um, and there's opportunity for engagement. I do want you to consider um, attending uh, the, the, the infectious disease-oriented meeting we're gonna have in a year um, and seeing where we go with all of this. It's, it's really just remarkably exciting. And um, communicate, be ambassadors, stick to the good science, and keep on, keep it on. So thank you. Yeah, no, we appreciate it. That was a fantastic talk. Uh, thank you for your time, your presentation, and, and all your insight into this emerging field. Uh, and thanks, everybody, for uh, joining in on this call. Um, and I also wanted to give Sean an opportunity to talk about next month's call, Sean. All right. Can anybody, everybody hear me? Yes. Um, all righty. So next month, uh, we have invited uh, a lawyer, uh, Ryan Osterholm, um, who designated himself as E. coli lawyer. Um, he is uh, one of the few specialized uh, football uh, attorneys. Um, a lot with, out a bit there, Sean. Uh, we'll deal a lot with the litigation process. So we will uh, let him to talk about his perspective about 
the real life impact of what we do um, in the core, as well as his uh, perspective about the transition from EFG to whole genome sequencing, how we can contribute to, um, to the real life side of the, of the story. All right, so I will send out a uh, when is good survey for everybody to participate on that call. And um, we'll be working with the steering committee, Scott, to get that poll out to see where the staff E community feels the next big uh, application of NGS is. Thank you, everybody. I'll be sure to make this recording available on the uh, APHL Collaborate site. Have a good day, everyone. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.